like to introduce uh, uh, Trevor Island from the Australian National University in Canberra as our second speaker. And uh, Trevor's going to talk to us about some of the early high temperature minerals that were formed throughout the, the solar system. Well, it's wonderful to be here back in Murchison. I came through with my life 20 years ago because Murchison is a special place for me, for instance. And all of the speakers who would speak in terms of science owe some part of their careers to basically this meteorite. So it's really important uh, for, for what we've done and effectively where we're going. So I, I thought I'd start with um, this, and this is what Murchison probably looked like at night. And so during at night you get to see everything that's going on. Of course, these images are because everybody now has a has a camera on their telephone. And so this is at a football game in the US and somebody got bored of the um, football game and looked up and started taking images. But you can see that this thing is fragmenting up. And this is still very high in the atmosphere. It's fragmenting up. Uh, lots of uh, little individual stones coming. You see these things streaming back as they get smaller and they burn. And when you look at Murchison, you can see these angular edges which have been rounded. So we know that this must have been going on in the upper atmosphere. And that causes dramatic heating. So my talk is about sort of early high temperature inclusions. Um, but it's not about the high temperatures associated with the infall into the, uh, into, into, the, into the atmosphere. It's about what's actually left inside this meteorite, as Philip was saying. So I'm going to talk about the, the high temperature inclusions in Murchison. Still getting rid of stuff. There we go. So, Murchison is not just any meteorite. There's a number of reasons for that. All sorts of reasons. Philip is a curator. Philip's job is to protect meteorites. I'm a scientist. My job is to consume meteorites. So there's a natural sort of tendency for us to sort of uh, fight it out as to how much material he will give me. 120 kilograms of carbonaceous chondrites, suddenly everybody's got all they need to do analyses. This also fell in the same year as Apollo. It also fell in the same year as we've heard IM day. Two tons of carbonaceous chondrite. And so suddenly you've got all this huge amounts of extraterrestrial material available for analysis. So it's like a step function at our understanding of how the, the solar system formed and what we, what we can get out of it. So Murchison's a primitive meteorite. It's not melted. It looks like dirt. In fact, I was shocked when I first saw my first section of a carbonaceous chondrite because it looks like dirt. I don't, I'm not working on this. How do, you, how do you do anything with this? It's just basically little bits of uh, clear inclusions in this clay-like material. Murchison's also a smelly meteorite, which tells you something fundamentally important. It's not being cooked. So if you cook a cake in the oven, it smells nice for a while, but then it dries out and it's, it's gone. Same sort of thing with, with Murchison. It had not been cooked to any level. So I'm going to be talking about um, high temperature objects within this, but this is in a really cold primitive meteorite. So there's some, an interesting juxtaposition there. So we have the, the, the cold, dark stuff here, very fine grained. This is the, what was uh, proposed to be the molecular cloud material when we first started looking at, at these objects. And we see these roundish sort of objects. These are chondrules, and I'm not going to talk about chondrules today. But these are round droplets of olivine and pyroxene, two to three millimetres in, in size, and they've been molten. So this is one form of very high temperature object. My passion, though, are these uh, refractory inclusions, which are rich in calcium and aluminium oxides, and they're quite often called to, um, CAIs for calcium aluminium rich inclusion, or if you're in America, calcium aluminum rich inclusion. Um, and these objects formed at really high temperatures. So if we look at something like Andy, this is an Andy, this is NWA4502, this is a museum type specimen with a CAI here, and that's 50 millimetres across. This is a huge object. Plenty of material to analyse. Again, the, the curator is not going to argue about this one. Um, as we've, we've talked, these objects give the oldest age of anything in our solar system. These define T0 of the solar system, 4567.3 plus or minus 0.3. And you might think, oh, that's going overkill. But it's not. 
because our solar system formed in about a million years. Even at that sort of 0.3 million year resolution, we don't have enough time resolution to fully understand how our solar system went from a molecular cloud into a fully functioning operational solar system that we have now. There's a lot of stuff going on in that time period. So this is the, 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 the typical um, cartoonish type schematic of how our solar system form. You start with a molecular cloud and because you start to swirl and compress the residual angular momentum, you end up with a disk, flattens out, and lo and behold, a star forms on the inside. Here comes our star forming. And uh, so this is about a million years of time, 45, 67 million years ago, and then um, things go on, it starts, gets to the end of its life, and it's accreting, and then it blows away all the dust, and suddenly we have planets left over. There's all sorts of problems with this cartoon, which we're not going to get into. That's planetary science, we're not talking about planetary science. So anyway, refractory inclusions come from the very earliest part of that schematic. Why do we turn them refractory? Calcium, aluminium, and titanium have the highest evaporation temperatures of any of the major elements. So these are, uh, well, we're not going to worry too much about that. So the refractory inclusions come from an early high temperature epoch. How high a temperature? Well, in the IM day inclusions, we have malolite, spinel, and pyroxene as three minerals, and they are in around about here at this 1400 Kelvin level of uh, material. So this is a complicated diagram. It's got temperature on the left-hand side. It's got something called carbon-oxygen ratio because this is for also for stellar condensates. And so Philips carbon stars are all sitting over here. We get graphite, silicon carbide. These are all the pre-solar grains. They're all over here. We're over here. There's solar there. So that's one of the reasons why we know these pre-solar grains aren't from our solar system. And then we can start looking at, with intrigue at the, uh, the isotopic compositions. So we, we think these things are really quite hot, and finding a heat source for that is really difficult. But it gets even more problematical when you start looking at the Murchison inclusions. So this was part of my PhD. Separate out these little blue guys here. These are about less than 100 microns across. So if, for those of you who have hair left, that's about one hair width, and we're sort of doing uh, analyses on those things, trying to understand where they're coming from. Now compare that, 100 microns, with a 50 millimeter inclusion. And you can see that you know, doing analyses of these things is really quite tricky. There's just not enough material. But these objects are really quite interesting because they're right up at the top. These are the first objects to form if we took our solar gas and brought it down in temperature. We hit corundum and hibonite. And hibonite being a calcium hexaluminate, corundum being pure aluminium oxide, this is as pure uh, an initial sort of material that uh, you could think of from the early solar system. So these are, the, the argument might be that these are formed earlier in the solar system. The Iron Day ones are cooler, so if we started off with a big pulse of energy, then the, the Murchison guys are, are earlier condensates, and then we're going down to Iron Day at lower temperatures and mixing in more and more stuff. So one of the big intriguing aspects of of Murchison Hibonite is what do, you, what do you get in terms of isotopes? Is it really from an earlier unmixed epoch in the solar system? So the, the, the key ingredient for the, the, these Hibonite inclusions is they contain calcium and titanium. And so I'm going to we'll talk a little bit about uh, where these things come from. And so we think these are effectively forming from the calcium and titanium, and the calcium and titanium, as, as, as Philip was, was saying, is coming from somewhere else. It's not coming as pre-solar grains. It probably did originally, but we don't see it. These things have been melted in the solar system. So these are precursor grains of calcium and titanium that condensed around other stars and other exploding stars. How do we know this? Through isotopes. We like measuring isotope ratios. So just to give a primer on isotopic compositions, uh, elements have specific number of protons in the nucleus. Oxygen, for example, has eight protons, eight neutrons. You know the difference between protons and neutrons? Proton and neutron go into a bar. Neutron says, barkeep, two pints please. 
Republican pulls the pints, gives it to the neutron. The neutron says, how much is that? And the Republican says, for you, no charge. <laughs> so isotopes of elements have the same number of protons, or an element has the same number of protons, that defines it, so oxygen has eight protons. Number of neutrons can be variable. They're chargeless and so they, they just come along for the ride. And so for oxygen we have O16, which is eight protons and eight neutrons. We have O17, which is stable, which is eight protons and nine neutrons. And oxygen 18, which is eight protons and ten neutrons. So here's a schematic of all this. So obviously the, the proton charge is balanced by the electron charge, so chemists like thinking of uh, elements as being defined by the electrons and of nuclear physicists like being talking about elements being defined by protons, same thing. The key issue here is that Earth's isotopic compositions and all these things are pretty constant. O16, 99.7%, uh, O17, 0.04%, O18, 0.26%. And the, there's a fundamental reason for that, as, as Philip was saying, because once you start getting these massive stars burning helium, which is mass 4, you get multiples on these multiples four isotopes. So O16 is a multiple of four, so four helium nuclei have gone on to form that, and O17 and O18 are produced by other proton and neutron reactions. This is an average composition, however. If we look at different stars, we will see different ingredients, and we can use that to identify our sources. So we're going to measure the isotopes. Yay. How do we do that? Um, Philip showed you one way of doing it, which is chemistry. Horrible, nasty stuff. You dissolve rocks and acids. Difficult chemistry. Your clothes get full of holes. The usual high school, high school problems. Um, you need lots of material to do this because there's all sorts of contamination and so forth. The alternative is to analyse the isotopes in place. And this is what's happened over the last 50 years. We, we can still do the chemistry. Chemistry is good. Don't, don't get me wrong. But now we can also analyse these things in place. And it's all to do with mass spectrometry and um, being able to do in situ analyses. So when they did the Allende refractory inclusions, these big things, calcium and titanium isotope anomalies, they found little excesses in calcium 48, titanium 50, also chromium 54 and nickel. Very small anomalies, one per mil. And we invented per mil because nobody could be bothered saying 0.1%. So we multiplied by 1,000 rather than 100. This is enrichment in the most neutron-rich isotopes. These are from pre-supernovae stars where you've got neutronized matter coming in. So remember the, the merging of neutron stars from the, from the gravitational waves that was announced earlier? This sort of process where you've got lots of neutron-rich material. But the anomalies are really quite small. One per mil is, is tricky. And that was actually the starting point for my PhD thesis. If, if you can find a one per mil anomaly in a big 50 millimetre inclusion, what happens when you go to something really small like a, a Murchison Hibonite grain? Can we actually pick up different isotopic signatures? And so the argument is, well, maybe you'll find big effects in small places. And the Hibonite contains percent levels of titanium, and so we can develop something to, to measure the titanium in situ because they're way too small for reasonable chemical isotopic analysis. And so I was part of a program of, uh, of shrimp, not for eating shrimp. This, I still get spam emails from people from China trying to sell me food products. <laughs> this is the sensitive high resolution iron microprobe which was designed and built in Australia. So this is the shrimp, it's a big instrument, it's the, sort of the largest uh, sort of uh, mass spectrometer you would expect to house inside an individual research department. So there's a source over here, there's an iron beam over here, there's a lots of vacuum control equipment in this. And then it goes, the, the, the ionised material gets sucked out here through an ESA, through the magnet, you need a magnet to separate out um, different masses, and then we have a detector system over here. So that's what shrimp was, designed and built in Australia. Anybody who wants to buy one, I will take off as around $5 million a piece, that's fine. Uses a focused iron beam, so this is a zircon grain here, so this is, the, this is one of the reasons it was built, so we can actually take this focused iron beam, we can target the rim, we can target the core, and we can actually get ages of, of a core, 1,050 million years, and an age of a ring, 20 million years. 
And the reason for doing this is the same reason we don't carbon date trees, by chopping down the tree and burning the whole thing up. We count rings. The zircons are actually the same sort of structures. We actually want to date events, not averages. If we average that, we might get 700 million years geologically. I have no idea what that would mean. So this spot dating actually revolutionised geochronology and it also allowed for these high sensitivity measurements for Murchison inclusion. So while my colleagues were busy developing things for zircon, I was busy in the lab trying to do calcium and titanium. And this is the, the, the overall image of what happened. So titanium 50, again, these are the bricks, but I'm just basically putting it on a scale here, and calcium 48. So these are the two heaviest isotopes. And what you can see, this is 300 per mil. This isn't, you know, 0.1 per mil, 1 per mil type stuff. All of the Allende and Earth stuff is in these black lines, which are basically at zero, which is terrestrial. These things show huge variations, and they're negative to positive. The positive ones go up to plus 27%, 270 per mil. I didn't actually need that fancy detector system. I could see it on the chart recorder. You, it's absolutely huge. And so these can be modelled to a particular type of exploding star, a type 1 supernova that basically gobbles up way too much hydrogen, and increases mass until it gets to 1.44 solar masses, and then, boom, explodes. So this was uh, completely verifying the, the fact that you get big effects in small places, so you've got these tiny time capsules recording formation of the solar system. We're getting elements from diverse nuclear sources, other stars, before they're getting mixed together in the early solar system, ultimately to form planets, and there are probably, you know, atoms of these things within us now. We have calcium in the bones, they're probably there as well, just not particularly anomalous anymore. These are formed in high temperature processes, likely close to the sun, but then you've got to get them out again. If you form these things close to the sun, so this is one of the big developments over the last 20 or 30 years, is really moving stuff about. Um, so, I put it there, that's all right. This is the active one. So, so this is three snapshots from the Hubble Space Telescope. This is a bipolar jet. It looks dark in the middle, so we're looking at a, an accretion disk edge on, and then there's a disk coming up here. And I think one of these will start. Yeah, this one's going to start. So you can see that if you recombine these things, so that's 1995, 1998, 2000. So that's over five years. And you can see the stuff being pushed back up. This is a jet away from a forming solar system. So it's these sort of images that weren't around when I was doing my PhD, they were shortly after, but it actually puts all of the stuff that we're analysing into astrophysical context. And that's the big development that's happened over, over the while. So why is Murchison special to me? It was a large primitive meteorite. 120 kilograms, I could get it. I just went to the, our RSES collection, pulled out a drawer, grabbed a bit, didn't ask, you know, it's, everybody knows it's easy to ask for forgiveness, and, you know, published a few papers. Oh, you've got some papers on it, that's fine, nobody's worried. So I got 67 grams of Murchison, which is not a lot. You guys have got more than me during my PhD. Pippinite is a marvellous mineral. It's blue, you know, blue thing's always good. Titanium isotope anomalies and, and, and Murchison and Hippinites are absolutely huge. The good thing about that was I was spending a lot of time trying to measure one per mil anomalies on shrimp, which is, believe me, is not easy. Those are small anomalies, you know, you're sort of counting irons, and it's like I was up three-hour analyses, 24 hours a day, so I was sort of uh, go to sleep in the lab for three hours, get up, move the spot, do another analysis sort of thing. These are some of the most pristine and earlier samples of the, of the solar system, and they tell an absolutely amazing story. 50 years ago, we would have been arguing about a hot homogeneous solar nebula with no vestiges of the origins. We thought it all got wiped out. Now we have a solar system formation in dynamic astrophysical context. So the, the last thing I want to show you is, is seeing it's a, you know, this is marking history. This is 50 years ago in Canberra, and this is uh, Ross Taylor, Ted Ringwood, Bill Constant, and John Lovering, in a much earlier, younger guise, receiving lunar samples in Australia, which was pretty much at exactly the same time as Murchison was, was landing here. So that was one of the reasons Murchison should have got more attention than it did, because the press was all functioning on these uh, 
these lunar samples which came into Canberra and everybody was excited by that. But as John Lovering has said, everybody should have been much more excited about Murchison. Thank you. Thanks, Trevor. Do we have uh, a question or two for Trevor, please? What sort of new equipment would you like to, 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 to take your research to the next level? What that's sort of tricky, and it's probably for the new generation. So I've been in terms, I've been involved in instrument development probably for all my career. But it's you know, once you've got this sort of technology, you're sort of developing it for doing other things, and then other people get interested doing terrestrial applications, so dating zircons, uh, doing chemistry of zircons, doing sulphur isotopes, so we can do all that sort of thing there as well. And Funnily enough, the, the, the government doesn't like funding too much cosmic chemistry. They'll, they'll tolerate a little bit of it, but don't go too far down that road or you know, the funding will dry up. And so you know, every, we, we're all involved in this balancing act between trying to get things done with what we'd like to do versus what we think we can get funded and, and what is, is scientifically reasonable for the country. So the new there's, I have proposed that we should, so uh, I've proposed that we should actually make what is known as a time of flight mass spectrometer because one of the things that the, the Philip's talking about, these pre-solar grains are really small. So even the silicon carbides are three microns or thereabouts, um, or even smaller, and once now we're looking at oxides and silicates in situ, by the time we find it, it's gone. And so what I'd like to do is do time of flight mass spectrometry where you actually can go back and interrogate. You've got everything coming out of the sample and then we can get magnesium isotopes, silicon isotopes, oxygen, and coupled with the oxygen isotopes so we can understand some of the processes which are going on. Okay. Uh, look, thanks, Trevor, very much.